Mountain Springs online community, what an amazing opportunity that we have to join together in worship and chasing after God. My name is Evan. I'm a part of the team here at Mountain Springs Church, and I'm so excited to be with you in this moment. A couple of things that I want to make sure that you are aware of. The first one is this. We have a connect card. If you're watching with us on Facebook or on YouTube, there is a link in the description. If you're watching with us on our website, something's gonna pop up in the chat. And we would love for you to just click on that and take like a minute to fill that out. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from, and how we can best connect with you. But don't stop there. Go ahead and let us know in the chat. Where are you watching from? Who are you watching with? Are you eating something, drinking something? Come on, let's just start some sort of conversation and welcome each other to this service. The second thing is this. We have a team that would love to pray with you. This has been a crazy year. And maybe you've had some hardships this year, some frustrations this year because, you know, it's 2020 or maybe just life in general. <sighs> Aside from everything else that's happening, life has just been tough. We have a team that would love to pray with you. So same thing, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, there's a link in the description. If you're watching with us on our website, something will pop up in the chat that will take you directly to our prayer team. And you can fill out a prayer request and they would love to come alongside of you and to just cover you and your family and your friends in prayer. So excited to worship together. Let's get to it. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the
found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my relief. Oh, Springs Online, it's so great to have the opportunity to worship together, to be reminded of the holiness of God. We're so glad to join together like this online. We'd love to hear from you when you're online. If you've never filled out our Connect card, we encourage you to click the button and do that right now. Or maybe in the chat, you'd just like to participate as we go through the service. We'd love to hear from you. And then if any of you need prayer at this time, we want to encourage you, use the prayer button. There are people there that are ready to pray with you and alongside you during this difficult time. You know, as we move through this month of December, we're looking ahead to Christmas Eve, and we have a very special experience planned for Christmas Eve.
We're going to be sending something out to you in the mail. Yes, the actual snail mail. Watch for that. You're going to receive an invitation to a Christmas Eve experience that we've been working on and will continue to work on as we prepare for that. It's going to be a great opportunity for you to gather with others and to celebrate Christmas Eve in a very special way. So watch for that in the upcoming mail. You know, this year, again, has been such an amazing year of generosity. Just this week, I got an email from somebody who had asked if they could help anyone in the church, and they had an idea in mind of, as to how they could help, and even a dollar amount. And then we received an email back from them just a few days later, and they said, you know, this is how much I was going to give to help people. And what I did was I gave half of that away, and I thought, half? Well, how come they changed their mind? But the second part of the email says, but then we heard about somebody who needed a car, and so we decided to give our car away to them in order to meet that need. As more and more people open up their hearts to God and open up their hands to live a generous life, we just keep hearing more and more stories of how God is on the move here at Mountain Springs. In fact, we'd love to direct you to this video that shares a little bit more of an example of how you've been generous in 2020. Hi. I'm Chip, and I'm the Mission and Outreach Pastor here at Mountain Springs Church. We know this year has been hard for many, and in the midst of that, I've had the incredible privilege of seeing firsthand the impact your generosity has had. I'd love to highlight just a couple of the amazing projects we've been a part of together. When COVID-19 first hit in the spring, many families went from making ends meet to being in really tough situations. As a church, we did a food drive and were able to provide 10 tons of food to the patrons of the Fresh Start Center. We also partnered with Cuz I Love You and were a host site for their annual Backpack Bash. With other churches throughout Colorado Springs, we helped distribute over 10,000 backpacks. What a way to help families kick off this crazy school year. Another area of impact has been through our care portal. Through this platform, agencies in El Paso County can submit requests that are specifically impacting kids connected to the social welfare system. And this year alone, 328 church members have responded to the needs of over 900 kids with an economic impact of over $230,000. In total, we've given away more money this year than ever in the history of Mountain Springs Church. And our impact extends beyond our local community and to the world. Because of your generosity, we supplied our ministry partners in Eswatini, Uganda, and Brazil with $15,000 in emergency COVID funds. And through our initiative to invest in leaders, we have supported nine pastors spreading the gospel in the Amazon rainforest and helped fund a church planning effort in Myanmar. I could go on and on about the impact of your generosity, but know that it has been an honor to see it unfold. God is doing incredible work through the ministry of Mountain Springs Church to make an impact on our community and around the world. Aren't those stories amazing? We have heard so many stories throughout the year of ways that your generosity has impacted missions here locally and globally. It's been the most amazing year for us in terms of generosity as we've given away more than any time in our history. There are even more stories than that, and you can find those on our highlights page of some of the things that have happened over the course of the year. I love hearing about how you, Mountain Springs, have lived your life this year with an open hand in the midst of all the chaos and shown your generosity to be so faithful. Maybe you might even want to consider a gift here at Year End as we continue to reach out in our community and around the world to share those resources with those in need. Well, we've been in a great series in 1 Peter the last couple of weeks, and today we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Daniel's got a great message for us. So as we get ready to dive into God's Word and go verse by verse through it, I want to encourage you, open up your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. Open up your app so you can follow along and take notes. But most of all, open up your heart as God speaks to all of us. Hey, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you today to Mountain Springs Online. I'm Daniel, and I serve on team here at Senior Posture. And 
whether this is your first time with us now for some weeks or whether this is something that you do every weekend with us. I am so genuinely glad that you are joining us on behalf of all of our team that make this weekend what it is, a very warm welcome to you. If you have been with us now for some weeks, you'll know that we are in a series going through the Epistle of Hope, First Peter. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those now and go ahead and turn with me to the second chapter of First Peter. The theme of our series is learning to live with hope in the now and the not yet. In the now and the not yet. And give me a moment to explain to you what that phrase means. As believers, we live in an era wedged in between two monumental moments in history. The first is the proclamation and the inauguration of the kingdom of God. That's when Jesus walked the earth. That's when he gathered with disciples and sent out apostles, the beginning of the work of the local church and the declaration of the kingdom of God. That's the inauguration. Well, we as a believer, we live in this era wedged in between that which has happened and that which is yet to happen. And that which is yet to happen is the full consummation of the kingdom of God. And that is when Jesus shall return, Revelation 21 verse 5, and speak new things over all things. New creation in the place of the old, weary, broken down form of creation that we live in. Let me speak to you what it means practically to live in between the now and the not yet. Here's what it means. What it means is we can pray for as a Christian community for miracles because of the inauguration of the kingdom, but yet in our lives, and you'll know this to be true in your life and in mine too, miracles don't always happen. We sing about breakthrough. We believe for breakthrough. We long for breakthrough. We long for it, but it doesn't always happen. And we walk around in these broken bodies of ours with so much bad stuff at times, so many broken things. We also pray for life. And yet, as many of us have, even today, over the last few years, we have realized through loved ones and dear friendships that people die. And while we pray and believe for new life, we also experience death. Indeed, it is the now and the not yet. It's the now and the not yet. But let me get to the content for today. We're going to have another message today that's going to speak about how we can be equipped to live in between the now and the not yet. And today we're looking at one of the most iconic verses that Peter penned, certainly in all of his epistles, but also one of the most iconic verses in all of the New Testament. And that is verse 9, where it speaks about a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a people that are called to be the unique possession of God. And my hope today is twofold. Today I want to I wanna fill your heart with faith. I want you to be filled up with the sense that God is at work in your life. But I also want to do this. So I want you to give me permission right now to do this. I want to break your mind a little bit. I want to shock you a little bit. And I want to kind of explode your thought as to the enormity of the local church and the mission of the local church. That it's not small and insignificant. It's enormous and redemptive and powerful and significant throughout every generation and every nation. So that's what I want to do today. Fill you with faith, but also kind of break your mind a little bit with the enormity of our mission. But we're going to pick it all up today in the second chapter in verse 4. As you come to him, the text tells us, a living stone rejected by men, But in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As with our previous weeks, we see a lot of imagery and metaphor taking us back to the Old Testament in our verses this weekend. And Peter begins by taking us back with this echo throughout all of the canyons of history to that of the Old Testament temple. This incredible building made up of rock and marble and all of this fantastic gathering for where it would house the presence of God. And Peter begins all of this imagery by speaking of Jesus in the context context of a stone, in the context of a rock, but not just any kind of rock. He's not some sort of inert piece of chiseled stone. Rather, Jesus is the innate nature, the eternal nature of the living stone, the living rock. Verses 4 and 6 tell us that the cornerstone is chosen and precious. You might ask, what is a cornerstone? 
Well, in ancient building practice, a cornerstone was the primary stone placed at the base and at the corner of any building. And it was the largest, it was the heaviest, and it was the most significant placement in the entire construction of the building. Why? Because it determined the foundation. And not only did it determine the foundation, but it also spoke to the unique design of the building. And most importantly, if the cornerstone was absent, the cornerstone was missing, the building would eventually collapse. And in quoting Psalm 118, verse 7, Peter says this, that Jesus was rejected as the cornerstone. He was rejected as the foundation of the nation. He was rejected as the foundation and the saving Messiah for all people. And yet, while rejected by men, Jesus was placed by God. Men and women, let's personalize this. We, too, reject God. We, too, you and I, have times in our lives where we reject God. And you say, well, how is that possible? Here's how it's possible. We set about building our lives, building them the ways that we want to. We set about our schedule. We set about our resource or our finances. We set about our children, our parenting. We set about our pursuit of hobbies and career, and we embark upon our lives. And too often, we build our lives the way we want to and ask God to bless what we have built rather than saying, God, build my life and bless my life, and flow through my life. And what we do is we build our own lives the way we want to, and then when the foundation starts to sink because it's missing the cornerstone, all of a sudden we appeal to God and say, God, I'm either going to ask you to bless this or I'm going to blame you for the state of my mess. We need the cornerstone. This year has turned out to be a doozy. It's going to be remembered for all of the wrong reasons. It's going to be remembered for a virus and economic challenges and maybe the loss of work. It's going to be remembered for all of the wrong reasons. But if there is indeed a silver lining to the COVID cloud, maybe it's this. That for many, this year has served as a necessary reset. A necessary reset to refocus on those things that matter most. Family and community and friendships and relationships. I want to ask of you right now, don't be in too much of a hurry as you go into next year and the following years to rebuild that which you previously had. Maybe for some of us right now, we need to take this as a move of grace and say, God, thank you for your grace. I have the opportunity to reset my life and rebuild it the right way. Don't build on the wrong foundation. Build on the cornerstone with your parenting, with your resources, of your schedule. Give of your time to the Lord. Of your resource, give of the tithe to the Lord. And in every way, invest your heart again. Peter continues with the metaphor of the temple, but this time really personalizes it to us in verse 5. He says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Together, you and I are being built together to the place to where the presence of God can dwell, the presence of God we can gather with, but also that God can be glorified in our midst. It's the spiritual gathering of the living stones forming the church of Jesus Christ. Well, Peter's thought about living stones, a series of blocks being built around and upon each other as indicative and symbolic of the church is language that Paul also used in the New Testament. He writes in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that you're God's temple, that, you're God, that God's spirit dwells in you? For God's temple is holy and you, you and I, we are that temple. We the saved become the locus of the Holy Spirit. We become the place of residence, the central place where the residence of God takes up home in our hearts. We, the saved, become those that carry the Spirit of God. And this is the first big concept that Peter wants us to realize today as he sets up the enormity of the mission of the local church. And he says this, that in the place of brick and mortar of the temple, now the heart and soul of the temple are you and I. We are the ones that God has chosen. We are the living stones. And I love what one commentator says about this. It's fantastic language each and every time they write. Someone places their trust in Jesus for salvation. Another stone is quarried out of the pit of sin and cemented into the building by grace. 
so good. It is so good. And so many, so many that look at the church and all they see is rubble and ruin. It's because they're unable to see the construction of something glorious. Men and women, I want to tell you right now, no matter what you see on social, no matter what you see posted by those that profess faith in Jesus Christ, if people are pulling the pin and lobbing the grenade on the social sphere about the church, they don't love the church the way Jesus loves the church. Yes, there's rubble. Yes, there are some ruins, but let me tell you, there is something that God is building. And you and I, if we're in Christ, we belong to the church. We can't separate ourselves out from it and lob something at it. We are the church. And we're not just part of a local church. We're part of the universal church. No matter where you go, no matter where you gather, you're part of the universal church. And so with Jesus as the cornerstone and Jesus as the living stone, therein by calling us living stones too, we're building a house, you and I. Right now, this weekend, we are building a house. In your house and in this house, we are building the house of God. So much so, Peter speaks of this incredible privilege, this incredible honor that we can be one with Jesus. Verse six, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Good news, come on now. Verse seven, so the honor is for you who believe. Go ahead and skip down with me to verse nine where Peter continues with this redemptive storyline of the church. He says, you and I, you and I are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. The beginning of this iconic section of scripture is a collection of nouns lifted once again from the Old Testament. The first series of words there, race and priesthood and so on and so forth, are lifted from Exodus, where God spoke over his people, declaring their identity over them. The latter part of those phrases are lifted from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. These names, and this is really important now that we catch this as we kind of set this next part of the message in place. Really important you don't miss this. These names were outlined by God to define and determine the missional identity of God's people at the outset of redemptive history. These were the terms that God gave to them to say, this is who you are. Well, let me explain and develop this for you. Since the beginning of time, God's plan has always been that his people Israel would become a kingdom of priests. You can read about that in Exodus 19. But as they would become a kingdom of priests, they would exert spiritual influence in their nation to benefit every nation. We say it to you again, they as a kingdom of priests would exert spiritual influence into their nation and other nations for the good of all nations. But they failed. Israel fell on her face once again. And instead of being a positive influence on godless nations, she, Israel, became influenced by neighboring pagan nations, bought into their pagan practice, and actually lost sight of their redemptive call. Well, now fast forward through history with me. Again, this is the series that we did earlier this year, The Story. Go back and listen to those messages about Babylon and exile and captivity, and it will kind of bring this story to life. Time and time again, time and time again, God spoke and appealed to them to stop their idolatry, but they persisted in their sin. Time and time and time again, through different voices and different ways and different means, God appealed to them saying, stop. You're not made for this. You're made for something better than this. Well, eventually it resulted in their exile to Babylon. So here's the reason that Peter uses such rich language regarding us. Now, don't lose this key moment in the message because of the history that seems ancient. Because of Israel's failure to live out her redemptive call, a prophet spoke up once more. The prophet in this case was Isaiah. <clears throat> and the prophet Isaiah spoke up and spoke of a second exodus. And the second exodus was spoken of in such a way that when God, as they returned from Babylon, God would do a new thing. And it would be the second exodus in the spirit, but in all reality. It's found in Isaiah 43. Let me read it to you. And you're going to recognize this verse, verse 18. Remember not the former things, now consider the things of old. 
Behold, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I love that word, by the way. I want to say it with an Australian accent because I heard someone say it once with an Australian accent. It's so good. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. No, 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 don't miss this. Do you, do you perceive it? And the emphasis is there saying, do you not perceive it? Okay, still with me. This is the application. I realize that a lot of us use this verse in the month of January and we use it out of context, but yet God works through that, context or not. Here's the context though. Peter is saying that Jesus is the new thing. Jesus is the new thing. And with Jesus as the new thing, aka the cornerstone, he will, God will, begin this new work where the church with Christ as the cornerstone will become the mouthpiece of the mission. We become the priesthood. We become the holy nation. Or say it another way. The church is now what Israel was intended to be. The church today is now what Israel was meant to be and in her better moments desired to be. And this is why, okay, so I'm gonna wrap so much together for you now from last week with Pastor Chris, but also the rest of this letter. This is the reason, now please don't miss this. This is the reason why Peter emphasizes so much the value of good conduct in this letter and his why. We don't just represent God to a broken world. We don't just represent God to an unbelieving world with our lives. We are God's people. We are God's people in order to showcase love and justice and gospel restoration. Now, before I go more on about the church, which I will, because I'm excited, here's what I want you to hear. In saying this, and it's an important sidebar comment that I need to speak out right now. To be clear, in saying all of this and applying Isaiah's prophecy to the church and so on and so forth, by no means does this mean that the church has replaced Israel. That is known, if you want to geek out for a moment, as replacement theology. We don't believe in, I don't believe in replacement theology, meaning I believe that God is not done with Israel and God keeps every promise he makes. And there are promises that God has made to Israel that are not supplanted through the commission of the local church. God will keep his promises with Israel. But here is what it does mean. The church is to the world what Israel was meant to be. Now, I really need you to hear that. The church is to the world what Israel was meant to be. We are now to show the world who the true God is, what the true God has done, and what the true God will yet do. That is living in the now and the not yet. And this is the grand message of the Scripture. The grand message of the Scripture is that Christ died for us. We can live with Him, and we are co-regents with Him in this grand story of restoration. That was God's plan all along for the restoration of that which was ruined in Genesis, the whole storyline of Scripture, from the garden of creation to the new garden of new creation, the garden city. We are commissioned in this in-between Oh, come on now. I hope, I, I hope you're getting sad. I can't see you in your living room or if you're on the trail right now, but I hope this is staring your heart. This is what we do. This is who we are. So much so, I want to zoom in very briefly on some of these key words. A few words, uh, descriptions, and a big final mandate. Four points. We're going to fill in some blanks here together. Uh, first of all, it says we are a chosen race. We are a chosen race. The church is a new race made up of many ethnicities chosen by God on the basis of grace and born into a living hope. Revelation 7, 9, read that powerful, powerful text. Speaks about this. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. And then notice the diversity and the beauty in gospel unity. Every nation from tribes, peoples, languages, Pay attention to the way that's written. Verse nine tells us that even in heaven, there is unique identity inherited from our life on earth, our color of skin, our ethnicity, who we are, what we bring, every tribe and every tongue and every nation standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, I wanna tell you something that God has been stirring my heart about for some time. For many, many years now, God has been stirring my heart that if that is the picture of heaven, Revelation 7, 9, where we see churches as one chosen race, one race made up by many races and ethnicities and callings and backstories and all of that in the same way, 
The obvious implication is this, that the makeup of our churches should represent and reflect the diversity present in our cities and our communities. Well, let me now speak to that. For many years now, for as long as I've been involved in the local church, like attracts like. Like attracts like. And it's almost in many ways created this homogeneity, this all of the same type, type of churches. To where if we're not careful, our churches, and I fear we have done that which we should not have done, like attracts like, we now have our churches not representing the beauty and the diversity of our communities, but they represent that which they see. And I want to tell you, I'm leaning into this moment, and I speak on behalf of all of our team and our elders and our staff and every staff person that our deep desire is to lean into, learn well, lead well, and enter into this space to bring that gospel diversity, that gospel unity under that grand redemptive call of Revelation 7-9. Maybe you heard me say uh, a few weeks ago when we had Pastor MJ here, I looked at Pastor MJ in this room and I spoke, her, spoke to her in the eyes and I just said, we do see color and it's beautiful. And it's this image that if I were to give roses to you, or if you were to give roses to someone you love in your life and you were to say, I think they have color, but I'm not really sure. To me, they appear gray. I don't see the color, but maybe you do. We would never do that. We would give because of the vibrant beauty of the color. And in the same way, we love color, we love beauty, and we celebrate it. So number one, we're all about creating this fantastic convergence of beauty amidst diversity, which is a picture of a chosen race. Second, it says we're a royal priesthood. Okay, let's have fun for a moment. When it says a royal priesthood, it doesn't mean that we have Windsor roots. It doesn't mean that we have Will and Kate, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge roots. What it means is we have direct lineage access to that of Jesus Christ. And speaking of the priesthood, in the Old Testament, the priesthood was populated by men from just one tribe, the tribe of Levi. But what Peter is saying is in this grand new restorative work of doing a new thing with Christ as a cornerstone and the church as the living stones, all of a sudden now there is the priesthood, you've heard this phrase before maybe, the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all Believers, men and women, young and old, there is this priesthood, the responsibility to minister the sacraments now falls upon in this new covenant and this new chapter in church history upon men and women, young and old, the empowerment of all. That is the priesthood of all believers. And that's what Peter is speaking about. 30 then says we're a holy nation. We're a holy nation. Pastor Chris last week spoke about the calling to be holy. We're called to be unique. We're called to live different from the world for the sake of the world. Let me say that to you again. We're called to live different from the world, holy for the sake of the world, restoration. We're called to be a unique people. But I want to leave you today with a missional charge from Peter's words. Verse 9 goes on to say this. With the authority comes great responsibility. He says, you are, you are, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our responsibility is to reveal to all of humanity the beauty of the gospel. Our final point, we are God's people on mission. As the people of God, we are to take up our holy vocation. God does more. Now hear me now. God does more than just light in us, bring light into our lives, displace darkness through the emergence and presence of light. He does more than doing it just to us. He, want, he wants us and invites us to then be light bearers to the whole world. And the red letters of Jesus and the red words of Jesus and the gospel of Matthew, you and Gelly and the good news of Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine let it shine so that, you, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Men and women, our lives ought to radiate this marvelous, beautiful light. We are saved on purpose for a purpose. We are saved on purpose for a purpose. We are people that have been brought out of darkness into a marvelous light that we might call others in their darkness into the grand 
lying. And as priests, we are called to be announcers, proclaimers, where we are proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Now, if you're anything like me, I've been around the language of good news and gospel so on, so often now that sometimes it loses its luster for me. But I've just got to tell you, let's never lose the wonder of grace. We're so familiar with the language that we maybe lose sight of what makes it so revolutionary. The wonder of grace and the power of the message. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people called to declare the excellencies of God. I want to leave you this weekend with a question. I want to leave you with a question. Is your view of church too small? Is your view of church too small? I suspect that it is, and here's why. Mine is. My view of church is too small. And even now, ask yourself, why, why are you still listening to this? For those of you that are the faithful soldiers and you're still tracking with us in this message right now, ask yourself, why? You know, it's 2020 after all, but even so, even still, some people just go to church because they've always gone to church. Some go to church because it's a parenting strategy. You've got to get our kids to be better. Maybe for some, we, quote, go to church or go online and engage in the message. Why? Because we want a little boost in our lives. Now, I want to say something. Whatever the reason, I believe that there is a better and there is a more ultimate reason why. We should be going to slash becoming part of the church. And when we realize this, when we realize this, it will change every weekend for the remainder of our living lives. It will change everything about the way we view worship, the word, community, small group, kids ministry, youth ministry, everything. And here it is. We're called to be the new Israel. We are saved under the new covenant of grace. And we are commissioned to be a people that put down signposts along the way that ultimately leads to the great way. And that is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are part of something so beautiful, so powerful. The church is not incidental to God's grand plan. The church is central. The church is central. It has always been God's grand plan for the church to proclaim the kingdom of God. So I ask you again, is your view of church too small? Is the church imperfect? Yep. Is the church in some ways needing to be purified by Jesus? Yep, me too. Does the church sometimes fail to step into her right environment? Yep, at times. But does God have another plan? No. God has no other plan, and we're chosen as a new covenant people of God to display the rule of God on this earth. He has chosen you and I. If we remain silent, who will speak? If we don't give, who will give? And if we don't go, who will go? So I say to you today, you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are called to be part of something so much bigger than you've ever realized. Love you, Mountain Springs. Wow, what a great time together of worship and teaching. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to bring up a couple of things once again, our Connect card and our prayer team. If you didn't get a chance at the very beginning, it's still open for you. We'd love for you to just click on that Connect card and just fill it out. Take about a minute. Let us know who you are, what's going on in your world. And we would love once again, come on, maybe Daniel said something that, that, that spoke to your heart that brought something to light, that pushed you towards, I just, I need prayer here. Come on, click on that so that our team can come around you and can cover you in prayer. We love you guys. We're praying for you. And we'll see you next time.